Hi, Sarah. How are you? Hi. So um, you were able to just screen share. I thought I might have to bestow that upon you. So that's great. <laughs> if you can see uh, Dr. Rebecca's slides, then yes, I am sharing. Great. It's actually, it's actually a PDF. I don't. I didn't get actual slides, so I'll just scroll through the PDF. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so then, um, so then I'll hand off the the meeting facilitation to you. Does that sound good? And then. Or I can make the intro announcements. Just there. Are, thanks sure. everybody who got. Yeah, if, you want, if you just want to do some quick housekeeping and you know post KubeCon welcome back kind of stuff, whatever you yeah. want. <laughs> well, um, everybody should feel free to should feel obliged to add yourself to the meeting notes. If you're not in front of a computer, just um, say so, and uh, somebody can add you. I'm going to open up the chat and I just put the link in the chat and then um, we have, we're trying out a new format um, where this is going to be a presentation. We're going to use the um, whole meeting time, except for some uh, of this bookkeeping up front um, for the presentation. And then if you have announcements, just put them in the um, document or shout them out in the chat and then maybe people can, um, who are taking notes can help. Um, and then we can use the um, meeting for uh, this time with Dr. Reback and, um, and then we can just uh, post the announcements on Slack at the end or just take a few minutes to shout them out if we end early. So, um, with that, I will hand it over um, does it I don't know if it shows on the participants. Does it tell you when you've got a dial in user or how does that work? because i I don't see her on yet. Well, it is just now ten a m. okay sorry. okay, so she's not here yet. I don't see any um, dial ins. So, um, so yes, I also want to welcome new folks 
from um, who might have um, heard about us at KubeCon or got reinvigorated. Um, when, uh, uh, and thanks uh, also to uh, Brendan um, Lum for stepping in on the intro because Dan Shaw couldn't make it to KubeCon um, in San Diego. So um, we have, I, I don't think the chat is persistent for new folks. So um, since it's just 10 a.m., I will post the meeting notes to the chat again. So our, um, our process is to add yourself to the attendance. Um, I'll also dig up um, the new meeting, the new members link, which has instructions about how to um, get engaged with the SIG. And, um, uh, and then when Dr. Robert, is it, um, is, maybe we have a phone call. Hi, I'm, Dr. Reebok, are you on? No, maybe not. I will unmute the phone. The phone person Hi. is unmuted. You can, uh, you can hear me now, right? Hi, yes, yeah. we can. Fantastic. Great. Excellent. So, uh, first of all, I just want to uh, apologize for some background noise. Uh, there was a bit of a, uh, actually a scheduling mix up on my side and uh, I'm actually on my way home from a customer uh, in the train. So I, uh, I found a quiet place in either case to sit, but there's no other people around. I apologize. I'm not usually quite this hectic, but then again, to be quite honest, uh, actually, I maybe I actually am quite this hectic <laughs> usually. So um, we're going to be talking about uh, open and transparent pen testing and also the particular workflow of my company. And oddly enough, uh, I would say that uh, my being a slight chaos monkey in terms of scheduling and working a whole lot from the road is actually really quite par for the course. <laughs> and uh, I thought about the rescheduling, but I think actually this gives you quite a representative look actually of how uh, my life actually is um, because we're a fully remote company. Um, you know, we've got uh, staff that are all over the world. Um, we've got folks in uh, throughout Western Europe. Uh, we've got folks in uh, Australia, in India, in uh, South, uh, I'm sorry, in uh, South America, also in South Africa. So, you know, we really are a distributed company in the true sense of the word. So, um, yeah, so actually, to be quite honest, we do not have an office, <laughs> um, which, uh, yeah, I mean, is kind of, I guess, modern for uh, how, you know, a lot of companies uh, work. And this actually does lead into the whole discussion of chat ops. Because, of course, uh, GitHub uh, is, uh, I would say, they, they invented uh, chat ops. Do you, do you all actually know uh, what chat ops is? Have you heard of this topic before? I confess that I have not. Okay. <laughs> and, and also, so I, uh, Dr. Rebeck, as you go through the, the slides, just give me a, a prompt or a next, please, and I'll, and I'll advance the, the slides for everyone. Yep, no problem at all. So, uh, yeah, so chat ops essentially is uh, it's a term that was coined by GitHub. So like uh, Radically Open Security, you know, we are a fully distributed company. GitHub also is a rather distributed company. I believe they might have an office uh, in the Bay Area, uh, but the majority of their staff is located uh, all over the world, uh, quite a few overseas, um, you know, really all over the place. And what they've done is uh, I would say their primary office, and I say office in quotes, is basically uh, chat. <laughs> uh, you know, many of us, of course, are familiar with uh, chat-like environments. I mean, things like uh, Slack, for example. Uh, how many of you use Slack or something similar? We need to be able to sh raise hands or something. Um, I think a bunch of us use Slack, I do. Okay. It's, uh, it's quite common these days, I mean, for uh, development teams. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's a really great way that if you have a distributed team, it doesn't necessarily have to be a distributed team, but it's, it's a great way of uh, combining both uh, synchronous as well as asynchronous communication. I see somebody said IRC, <laughs> indeed. Uh, we, uh, we actually started using uh, IRC, uh, but we actually switched uh, over to Rocket Chat because uh, it was 
easier for customers to deal with. <laughs> a lot of customers were actually a bit intimidated uh, by uh, internet uh, relay chat. However, um, if you guys are familiar with IRC, you, you probably will know about like old school chat bots, right? <laughs> Uh, you know, the kind of uh, bot that uh, takes that, you know, uh, slash hands, you know, commands that uh, Christian just typed in and that interprets it. So, um, you know, these bots essentially have been ported for uh, new, um, you know, chat media like uh, Rocket Chat, Slack, uh, Mattermost, uh, Campfire, you know, a number of these different chat platforms. Now, what GitHub did is they built, first of all, a uh, open source uh, chat platform. Uh, I would say, oh, sorry, what happened to hip chat? Yeah, good question. Not a clue. Um, but, um, so yeah, so basically they built an open source chat bot uh, that's called Qbot. And uh, you can find it in, uh, well, in GitHub, <laughs> in GitHub's GitHub. And um, what it does is it takes I would say their their operations, and it kind of functions like a command and control center for uh, their DevOps and for their uh, system administration, and and generally for, for their I would say their business operations. So, for example, their system administrator team would use um, this chatbot for doing things like uh, say uh, deploying a new server. So they could say something along the lines of. Qbot uh, deploy a new server, and then Qbot would then say, "Okay, thank you very much. I just deployed a server. Uh, here's the information." Or you could issue it another command, uh, something along the lines of, "You know, Qbot, uh, please, you know, display uptime statistics, you know, for these particular servers." And then Qbot would come back and it would say, "You know, okay, well, here's the uptime of these particular servers, and here's some pretty graphs." And the really nice thing about chat ops is it enables uh, human written conversation to uh, basically be able to um, be interspersed with text. Oh, by the way, uh, Robert, I forgot to say, you can advance the slide, <laughs> by the way. So, uh, oh, actually, uh, the next one after this, sorry. <laughs> okay. So, um, so basically, uh, the idea then is that uh, you know, you, you are really turning your chat room into the command and control server of your, uh, well, control, sorry, command and control center of your actual operations. So people in a distributed team can basically do some work, and then other people can comment on it, and all of this is in line. So it's a really great way of actually coordinating distributed teams. So... I saw this presentation that uh, GitHub gave at the DevOps days uh, in Amsterdam, and for me it was like, you know, the heavens opened. It was like this light bulb went on, and I was like, oh my god, this would be so amazing for penetration testing. So I ran home, and uh, we uh, had uh, put, uh, basically installed uh, Rocket Chat, and um, yeah, basically immediately installed Qbot, and away we went. By the way, Robert, I'm noticing that you actually have an older version of the deck. I think that Stephen actually sent you the wrong version of the deck. I'm sorry. So it might actually be best if we just leave it on this slide and I just continue with telling the story. I think we actually don't need slides uh, too much anyhow. So um, anyway, so uh, so I will uh, yeah continue on with the story. So then basically um, the so, – so yeah, so, so at that point I figured, you know, this would be – really excellent for penetration testing. So the first thing that I did, you know, we installed Qbot. Uh, of course, the first thing that my penetration testers did is try to try to hack it, of course. <laughs> um, you know, but then uh, after that, you know, I really discovered that there's a whole lot of different uh, tools that you can basically install and be able to run from this chat command line. So for example, uh, one thing that we do is uh, we have, like every penetration testing company in the universe, we have developed um, our own uh, penetration test uh, report uh, generation system. You know, we automate all these all the boring bits away, 
uh, we have open sourced uh, our system for doing this, and we also made it an OWASP project. So if you actually look up OWASP pen text, then you can actually find uh, this pen test reporting system uh, that I'm talking about. And of course, it's open source. Everyone is free uh, to use it, download it, install it, uh, benefit from it. And what it does is it is XML based. And it uses XSLT style sheets. So basically, anyone can, you know, replace the logo and the house style uh, with their own um, logo and house, house style, and they're free to use it themselves. Now, the way that it works is that uh, typically you would have a. Well, actually, could you uh, go to the next slide? I think some of what I want to tell is probably uh, <laughs> still on here. So, uh, Robert. Uh, yeah, exactly. So oh, you can go back up again. Sorry. Uh, this slide, yeah. So, um, you know, this is, uh, again, this is a very old set of slides, so this has uh, changed quite a bit since then. But you could see originally with the Rawspot help menu, it came installed with a list of default uh, functions that, be, uh, that came with a chatbot. Of course, the majority of it uh, we uninstall. I mean, obviously, if you see something like Rawspot shell command <laughs> as a hacker, that's not the kind of thing you're going to get really happy uh, with. But uh, we basically tossed out the majority of that stuff and instead uh, retooled it uh, with the things that we needed. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm on the train. So uh, if you can then go down to the next slide. Um, excellent. So you know this is basically uh, an illustration of this XML pen test reporting system that I was talking about, this uh, OWASP pen text. So what it is, is it starts with, for example, if we want to write a quotation. So uh, if we are making a quote, what we do is we start out with this thing called quick scope. Um, and what you can do is you fill in uh, an A4's worth of, uh, of uh, text. And then what you can do is type a command into the chatbot that basically says raw spot. And we call it raw spot because we're radically open security. And that's basically the name of our chatbot. So we say raw spot. Uh, quick scope, and then the name of, uh, for example, a test uh, repository. At that point, what the chatbot does is it takes that A4's worth of, um, of, of uh, XML, and then it expands it into 13 pages of XML. And uh, that the uh, 13 pages of XML basically contain all of the boilerplate, so of course all that boring stuff that we automated away. And then at that point, if you want to make like little fiddly changes uh, to the boilerplate, that's the moment at which you can do it. The next thing uh, that you can do is uh, you can then uh, type in another command into the chat box, and then basically that would say um, raw spots build, <laughs> and then uh, the name of the uh, PDF. Actually, can you, uh, can you go down to the next slide? Robert? Okay. So here's an example of the uh, uh, expanded XML. Okay. Go down to the next slide. Yeah. And after you, uh, after you hit compile, this is basically what comes out. And as you can see, uh, this pen test report looks pretty much identical to every other pen test uh, report uh, in the universe, basically. I mean, you know, it uh, contains all the necessary things, uh, indexing, uh, classification, threat levels, short description, technical description, and also uh, remediation advice. Um, can you go down again to the next slide? So, yeah. So again, I apologize. This is really super, really a super ancient. We've replaced all this stuff since then. We don't use shell commands. Uh, anyway, I apologize that you have an ancient version of this stack. But uh, in either case, you can, I think, still get the uh, get the idea. What, what we do have these days is a command called raw spot build, uh, and then uh, you put in the name of the repo. Now, what happens? is that uh, raw spot at this point, it actually, you can see it's doing, the first thing it does is it's doing a git clone. So it actually takes the, uh, you know, the uh, git repository uh, in which the uh, XML uh, has been pushed, it clones it, and then on the, on the server, locally on that side, it then runs the XML tool chain to essentially compile everything. And then what it does is it uh, spits out a clickable link that then at that point, uh, anybody who is in that chat room can actually click on it, and then it opens up uh, basically that PDF. 
So that's actually really super handy because anyone who's in the ch that channel can automatically see what you're doing. Um, in the newer version of the deck, I apologize that you have the wrong version, but uh, also another thing that it does is it automatically password protects um, the deck. It would be much better if I could share my screen, actually. Let me see if I can. Uh, the only thing is I'm on this browser-only version of Zoom right now. Yeah, I'm not sure if it needs yeah. to download the, the plugin to be able to present work from real quick. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I wish I could get you a new, a new version of the deck right now, but it's probably not time. Um, yeah, this is really, can, really awesome. We can post it um, on the meeting notes after the, after the call. Yeah, that, that would be better because, uh, yeah, I apologize that my uh, project team sent me on version. Sorry. Anyway, but, um, but the point is that, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, actually, there's even better example reports uh, that you can look at uh, than the one that you just posted, Chase. Uh, if you go to uh, our website, so basically uh, radicallyopensecurity.com, uh, if you go up to the top, then you're going to see uh, uh, basically a portfolio uh, section. So, uh, and this is actually uh, a far more recent uh, version. And what you can see is uh, well, quite a few different, like for example, uh, click on the um, XFAT XML parser uh, report. This is uh, the most recent version of what comes out. So that, yeah, you can actually see that uh, this is uh, what comes out of it. Of course, ignore the content for a moment because this is uh, not relevant. I mean, this is just a, a job we did for um, Open Tech Fund, or maybe for Mozilla Foundation. Oh, I, okay, never mind. I think we did it for Moss. Uh, scroll down a bit more. Oh, can you scroll down a bit more in the uh, PDF? Robert. Hello? Are you not seeing my, my screen or no? I'm oh, sorry. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We're yeah, looking at some live XFAT. Okay. Ah, okay. Oh. So basically, uh, what you can see is basically, again, it looks more or less like every <laughs> head test report in the universe, including automatically indexed uh, findings. It all automatically uh, generates uh, all the summary tables. It automatically uh, generates also... Uh, statistics and whatnot. So anyway, but this, this is enough. I think this is maybe you can post uh, to this wiki.mozilla.org into the Zoom group chat. Uh, then people can look at it later uh, at their leisure. Yeah, but, it's in the uh, chat. Thanks. The Sorry? It's posted What'd in the say? chat. Okay. I cool. was just saying it's in the so chat. Maybe, excellent. So let's go back to the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Um, are, you, are you seeing the, the slides again? Yeah, Robert, could you uh, go back to the PowerPoint presentation? Hmm, okay, I think it is, but uh, is everyone else seeing the pen testing slide, pen testing chat ops too? Yes. Okay. There, there might be some lag okay. on your uh, Dr. Rebach. Yeah. Okay, for some reason I'm still on the PDF, but uh, okay. Yeah, I think we're all seeing um, the slides again. Okay, I can't see the slides uh, for some reason. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing the slides, so I think it's it might be a lag on the train internet. Yeah, yeah, possible. Uh, all right. Well, anyway, so uh, going back to the slides, I can't actually see them right now. But let me see if I can maybe uh, refresh this. Uh, give me a minute. It would be kind of handy if I can see the slides. You know what? I'm, I'm going to leave the meeting and then log in again, see if that helps. Hold on a minute. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm called in on my phone. So uh, that's uh, right. We're attending the meeting. Just trying to rejoin the meeting again with Zoom. Okay, sorry, rejoining the meeting now. <laughs> uh, now I can see the slides again. Excellent. So, um, great. So basically, uh, at this point, uh, you can see uh, on the slide that uh, this is the GitLab repository, uh, just uh, sort of on the back end uh, of that, uh, uh, well, basically of that uh, pen test report. 
Um, most of the time you don't really need to use it, but it just gives you an idea of what the, uh, what the structure is like. So can we go on to the next slide? Okay. So, you know, the question is, so, so obviously you can use uh, a chatbot for something along the lines of pen test reporting. That's great, because, you know, that's something that any pen test team needs to do. But then that really begs the question, what else can you do, right? <laughs> so uh, here's another example. Uh, at one point in time, we did a uh, assignment where we needed to do some uh, passive scanning. So we built a tool. Uh, we also open sourced it. And this takes the output of uh, Shodan and uh, Centis, uh, formerly scans.io, and it correlates uh, this information. And this is then something that we can launch from the, uh, from the chatbot. So uh, as you can see, you know, this is starting to get away from reporting and to get a bit more towards actually that are, uh, that are functional. Uh, and again, it, it's all sort of stuff you can launch via that chatbot. So uh, could you please uh, move on to the next slide? Great. So this is uh, something else that uh, the chatbot makes possible. So uh, we've got this concept that we developed called red-blue pen testing. Now, what that means, of course, I'm sure you all are familiar already with things like uh, red team exercises, red or blue team exercises. We take a group of developers, sysadmins, and DevOps folks, and we basically uh, take about a dozen of them, we split them into two teams, and we actually gamify their pen test. So they actually compete against each other to see who is best at hacking their own stuff. So it's a really unique experience, you know, for these uh, for these engineers, because you know they are used to being in the role, of course, of developer, and it really takes them out of their normal role. Uh, you know, puts them in the shoes of the hacker, and because they're competing, you know, it puts them in a total totally different mind space. Now, each of the teams is guided by one of our professional penetration testers at Radically Open Security, and the number one comment that we tend to get from these developers once the exercise is over, is, and I quote, I will never look at code the same way again. And that's why we do it, <laughs> you know? So you can see right here how we're actually making use of chat ops to build the scoreboard. So in this particular case, uh, I type in a command, good job blue. The bot at that point then says, incremented blue, 24 points. It prints out a motivational image, and then, you know, again, this is just to keep people motivated, you know, to be, uh, you know, to, to be hacking, to put them into that place of, of gamifying it. And, you know, this is the kind of thing that you can do with, uh, with chat ops that is very, very difficult uh, to be able to do with uh, a physical room. Okay? Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Oh. <laughs> Thanks. So, um, but actually, it turns out that there's much, much, much more that you can do with a chatbot. You can run, you know, tools for, uh, you know, things like scanning and exploitation. So, port scanning, web vulnerability scanning like W3AF, uh, SQL injection tools like SQL Map, forcing passwords uh, with Hydra or other related tools. Uh, of course, the word lists and everything go on the server, but it gives you a single unified interface that you can use to run all these tools. It's super handy. Also, in terms of uh, reconnaissance, you can do things like uh, who is Google, uh, the passive scanning tool, you know, let me duck, duck, go that for you, you know, whatever. And then uh, you can basically uh, do a bunch of those kinds of more standard uh, uh, recon uh, uh, using tools like that. And again, all of this can be invoked uh, from the chat box. Similarly, uh, there's other exploitation things that we can also do uh, via the chatbot. So, for example, hash cracking. You know, this is a very common thing that pen test teams uh, do uh, in the course of, of an engagement. Um, but, you know, what we can do is we have actually implemented rainbow tables on our server. So what that means is I can take uh, my device, and it can not necessarily even just be my laptop. It could be 
my cell phone. It could be, you know, even a smartwatch if I can get it through the, the, the couple layers of authentication to get into our chat environment. Basically, any web-enabled device is capable of interfacing with this chat ops system, which means that I can be sitting on a bus, you know, somewhere in the middle of Lord knows where in the Netherlands, like I am right now, actually. And, you know, I can then run rainbow tables against your, against your hashes, you know, for my cell phone. You know, and this is power. You know, this is the ability to be able to work from anywhere, you know, and really to be able to bring together a distributed team. Now, sorry, one second. <laughs> Is that the train safety uh, lecture? All right. <laughs> sorry about this. So uh, anyway, but uh, well, sorry. I guess some of this chaos kind of makes my point. Sorry, I'm changing trains right now because I have to go back to Amsterdam. But uh, the point is that uh, we really can work from anywhere. <laughs> you know, and when I say from anywhere, I do really mean from anywhere. So um, the idea then is that um, we developed uh, also this concept that is called peak over our shoulder, okay? And uh, of course, the, the, you know, the title of this talk was uh, really discussing openness and transparency in pen testing. So radically open security, you know, we are uh, – Really, you know, the company was started uh, because of some discontent that I had about the pen test industry as it is. So um, I used to actually work in the uh, cybercrime team at ING Bank. And uh, the, um, you know, we had certain incidents. And then during these incidents, what happened is that some of the larger uh, security consultancy firms were called. They came in. And then they kind of had this uh, attitude of, you know, um, we're the experts, you know, we're lead. Security is hard. Stand back. We're going to solve everything for you, you know, and then we're going to give you the report and then the, the big invoice and, you know, everything like that. You know, at that time, uh, I also said to them, you know, well, OK, great. I'm, you know, uh, my name is Melanie and I work for the cybercrime team of the bank. So if you guys are so lead, um, uh, actually, can you go back to the previous slide? Sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm not on this one yet. So, thanks. So, so basically, um, you know, if you guys are so lead, that means there's probably a whole lot that I can learn from you. <laughs> uh, so, you know, what I would actually like to do is watch what you're doing, you know? And, uh, <laughs> well, to make a long story short, uh, you know, these uh, consultancy companies, the really large corporates, really did not like that. So, you know, they did things like uh, throwing away bash history logs, working in screen and like, quote unquote, forgetting to turn on logging, even though I reminded them like, you know, 10 times to do it. <laughs> and then ultimately, uh, you know, I, I literally stood next to them and looked over their shoulder <laughs> because to be quite honest, that was the only way that they couldn't get rid of me. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I mean, slightly annoying. <laughs> But uh, anyway, you know, I, I was a bit upset about this because, you know, for me, security is a process. Security is a mindset. You know, security is not a set of Band-Aids that one applies, you know, to, to, you know, fix whatever errors that you happen to have this time. I mean, you actually need to convey that hacker mindset. Otherwise, the developers and, and, and other folks are going to continue making the same errors, <laughs> you know, next time. So, uh Basically, sorry, just give me a second. Uh, I'm going to wait till after the announcement's over. Okay, I think they're done. So, yeah, so basically, uh, you know, and, and I just uh, didn't really like how commercial these companies were acting. You know, I mean, the culmination of this was I actually bought a box of analysis tools uh, from one of these companies. And um, I, you know, after we purchased the box, I wanted to log in and I asked them, you know, Hey, could I perhaps have the password so I can log, log into this box? And they were like, yeah, but you know, there's like proprietary tools on here. So uh, we can't give you the password at which point I was just like, well, 
you know, WTF did we just buy? <laughs> you know, so it was sort of this arrogance, <laughs> you know, and, and lack of willingness to educate, you know, that actually was one of the reasons why I made radi- I started Radically Open Security in the first place. Um, I mean, for, I guess now, now is probably a good time to talk a little bit uh, about uh, my company's business model. I don't want to talk about it too much because it's a long story and that's not what this, uh, this presentation this evening is about. But the, some, some background information that you should know is that Radically Open Security is a not-for-profit computer security consultancy company. Uh, this is weird, <laughs> needless to say. I, it's extremely weird. Uh, you know, and it's also confusing, right? What do we mean by not-for-profit? Well, it turns out that, um, you know, I wanted Radically Open Security when I first started it. I wanted it to be different, you know, but I didn't know how to do that. So I went to my friend, uh, Michiel Lehners, uh from the NL, NLNet Foundation, and I said to him, you know, I want to make this different, but I don't know how. And Michiel said, well, you know, there's actually this very interesting tax construction from the Dutch church. So, you know, basically what it is, um, it's essentially, uh, well, as he said, it, it's sort of a kind of tax designation. And it's called, uh, in Dutch, a uh, fiscal fondsverfende instelling. In English, a fiscal fundraising institution, an SFI. Now, what this means is that sometimes a, uh, sorry, one second. <laughs> Anyway, kind of feels like we're in the Netherlands, right? <laughs> For all of us. Anyway, so uh, let's continue on. So basically, uh, actually, sorry, what was the last thing I was saying before the announcement? Uh, You're talking about the SFI. Oh, okay, right, the SFI. So basically, um, we, uh, so sometimes the church wants to do a commercial spinoff. So, uh, you know, they'll like bake some brownies or something, and then they're going to raise some money, and that money goes back to the church with a tax benefit. Now, uh, what happens is that uh, there's, there's a famous example of this in the Netherlands, and it is uh, this language institute that's called uh, Regina Chaley. It's otherwise known as the uh, Nuns of Fucht, the Nonnen van Fucht, and this is a pretty well-known uh, language institute. Uh, and basically, the nuns started the Language Institute. It's a really great independently operating language institute of really high quality. In fact, our queen in the Netherlands uh, learned uh, some of her Dutch there. She's originally from uh, Argentina. Um, and what is this? I missed the intro. This is Melanie. Who? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Sorry. Um, I'll add so, in the chat. Sorry? I'll add in hmm. info in the chat. Oh, okay, cool. So, um, all right. So basically, uh, so this, um, so that's the kind of the way it works. These nuns started the Language Institute. The Language Institute earns money, and then that money goes back to the nuns again. That's the way this FFI construction works. So I said, you know, that's really interesting. Uh, I'm going to take this FFI construction, and I'm going to make my commercial spin-off a security consultancy company, and I'm going to make my so-called church the NLNet Foundation, okay? So uh, NLNet is a Dutch charitable foundation that it actually was one of the, originally one of the first ISPs of the Netherlands. And uh, it was acquired by what's currently our national tele, tel, telecom company. And basically the whole thing got turned into a foundation. And for the last 20 years, they've been giving that money from that acquisition away. So they fund projects like uh, the EFF, GNU, TOR, JITSI, DNSSEC, WireGuard, academic research. I mean, basically anything for, you know, digital rights, open source, and anything for a better internet. So basically what I did is I ensured that 90% or more of my profits legally had to go to NLN. So basically the profits for my company would go in full to the community from which my hackers originally came from. So, you know, of course, which is 
weird, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, the last 10%, of course, is uh, basically our cash flow buffer, and that is what enables me to actually run a business with it. So we are a social enterprise, but it actually goes further than that uh, in the sense that we actually give basically all of our profit away to charity. And of course, there's very few social enterprises uh, that do, that really go that far in trying to make sure that that money goes back uh, to social interest. So, um, yeah, so basically, uh, that, that is sort of the weird story about my business model. But then, uh, if you want to hear more, by the way, I uh, gave a talk in June at uh, TEDx Berlin. Um, and uh, the talk is uh, called uh, Post-Growth Entrepreneurship. Uh, you can, if you Google it, uh, you can find it. And uh, if you all want to know more about sort of the story of my company and how we're nonprofits, uh, I would recommend that you listen to that TED Talk. I don't want to say too much more about it right now because, again, I want to focus on security this evening, <laughs> and I don't want to tell a business model story to you, but, uh, but at least I think it's, understand to, it, it's useful to understand this much uh, to help you understand the context of my company better. So anyway, um, but, uh, you know, we have core values of openness, transparency, and open source. So basically all of the, uh, the tools, the software, the uh, architectures, everything that we create, also documentation, legal documents, trainings, everything that we create, we optimize for releasing it directly into the open source. So if you look at our GitHub repository for radically open security, it's super active. I mean, we also have a gitlab.com uh, uh, repository as well. Uh, which also has some other uh, pieces because uh, we use GitLab CI for some things. Um, but basically, uh, yeah, and uh, in terms of openness and transparency, that's when we came up with this whole idea of the peak over our shoulder workflow for penetration testing. So the way that it works uh, is, um, you know, I, I already told the story about uh, how I was looking over the shoulder of that consultancy company uh, when I was working at the bank. Well, the idea is we invite uh, customers to join us in our chat rooms so they can actually overhear every single conversation that our pen testers are having. And so they can also see via the chat bot <laughs> every single action, you know, basically our operational action that my hackers are taking, you know, because there's, there's the chat bot and it, um, we've got it hooked up to the GitLab repository. So every time uh, one of our pen testers makes a comment, for example, in a GitLab issue for that repository, the chat bot then says, uh, you know, this pen tester just made this comment at this timestamp, click here for more information. And then if you click on it, as long as you've got access uh, to that repository, it takes you there and you can actually read the comments that that uh, pen tester just made. Same thing with uh, pushing scan results uh, into the repository. Uh, again, it's just using Slack, uh, you know, basically the Slack API. And, uh, uh, and you know, it, so what it does is it provides this constant feed of, you know, blow by blow exactly what our hackers are doing. <laughs> you know, and this provides, you know, unprecedented transparency into the pen testing process. You know, and it sort of takes that black box of security consultancy and it actually explodes it inside out and it makes it so transparent that it's almost annoying. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's basically our objective. But it turns out that, you know, it is a really popular formula and it's actually gotten us a lot of customers and our customers are super happy with it. You know, we've got a very high retention rate of customers, um, you know, and we, uh, you know, uh, it turns out actually that customers like being educated, you know, I mean, they like being treated with respect. They like, you know, if you optimize for knowledge transfer, uh, you know, I mean, it's kind of nice if, you know, almost every single pen test that you commission, that it's almost like a training exercise at the same time that you're actually receiving a pen test. And it turns out that it's actually value for money that's really hard for the corporates to compete with, <laughs> you know, because, you know, we've automated it as such that the openness and the transparency is actually built into our infrastructure and facilitated by the chat room and this chat bot. <laughs> so we can basically, in the course of uh, doing our normal work, you know, in the normal way, uh, it's designed, you know, to, to 
bring that transparency to the customer. We don't even have to do anything extra uh, to include them. And of course, you know, because of this, you can imagine how attractive this is. Um, so going back to the slides, you can see at the bottom of the exploitation uh, bullet point, it says spear phishing. So he here's an example of one thing that we built uh, that makes use of this peek over our shoulder. So uh, we do phishing exercises uh, for uh, lots of different kinds of customers. And one thing that we can do is we have built uh, a phishing suite. Uh, this is also, by the way, open source. This is available, again, in GitHub. And uh, what it does is it's a set of scripts. Now, the first script uh, can be invoked from the chatbot. It can take, you can basically fill in a URL or push a newsletter, basically, into a, a GitLab repository. And then what happens is it can actually scrape that for you and then add instrumented links. Now, the instrumented links basically go to our web server, and of course, the web server is connected via the Slack API with our chat. So the moment that um, a subject, uh, you know, basically, of the, you know, that's receiving this email, or not the subject, I'm sorry, uh, one of the receivers is uh, clicks on a link in this email, uh, the, the, the Slack API sends a notification to Rocket Chat, which then prints out a message saying, you know, this uh, email recipient address uh, just clicked on this pretext name at this timestamp. So you can literally watch while your own staff is getting fished in real time. You know, this is great, you know. Uh, and, and again, none of this would actually be possible if uh, we didn't have chat ops. Um, similarly, uh, you know, if, if you use forms, like for example, sometimes uh, we'll have fake uh, Office 365 forms or AD, you know, AD logins or you know these kinds of things, and um, you know, again, people can uh, fill in the forms, and then in real time, the chatbot can say, you know, uh, you know, these are the credentials that were just entered into this form, <laughs> you know, from this uh, from this email address. Uh, so, I mean, and this is actually really a lot of fun, you know, so the security officers can sit there and watch people playing with the, the form, you know, the phishing form that you just sent them. I mean, at one particular um, occasion, I can remember that uh, we were phishing a, uh, a hosting provider. And at a certain point, uh, one of their technical members of staff noticed that something in the domain name wasn't quite right, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a phishing test after all. So at a certain point, this guy started playing with the form. So we could see him putting in things like, you know, uh, username, I don't know, something, you know, password, something else. Username, I don't know, woohoo, password, nice try assholes, <laughs> you know. Uh, username, I don't know, some sort of thing, and then password, SQL injection, <laughs> you know. Though the SQL injection didn't work, but, you know, he definitely got points for trying. You know, of course, that begs the question of was this guy in a sandbox environment while he was playing with our form. But nonetheless, you know, at a certain point, we kind of breaked from hunch, and the security officers were like, yeah, man, thanks. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, that was quite entertaining. So, yeah, and again, these are the kinds of experiences that I think really only are possible <laughs> with this kind of form of peek over our shoulder, you know, with actually including the, uh, the user in the chat room. But I think there's actually much more that you can do. Anyway, can you go to the next slide, please? So, um, but there's actually much, much more that you can do uh, via the chat ops. Um, you can also use it for all of the other kinds of operations that you would have uh, for just running a business. You know, uh, radically open security, just like any IT shop, you know, we need project management. And uh, like some uh, companies, we use uh, Kanban, basically, to manage our workflow. You know, we've got a lot of different projects going on, so we need some way of being able to uh, make sure that the, uh, the work is flowing through the system. Uh, and we also use uh, sometimes the uh, open source uh, project management software, Canboard, uh, which is basically an online Kanban board. We've actually made it so that we can dump uh, the contents of the CAN board from a um, command to the chat box, and we can even do other things. This is kind of fun. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the uh, Ship It Squirrel. Have any of you heard of this Ship It Squirrel? 
Yes. Okay. So somebody knows about the ship at squirrel. So the ship at squirrel is basically this really silly geek thing. I can't really call it anything else. And um, if you type in ship it, then the chatbot spits out a squirrel. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, this doesn't work in Zoom. <laughs> but yeah, you basically get a squirrel, and every time you get like a different kind of squirrel. Um, anyway, it's really silly. <laughs> but you know, when you have geeks in your company, we kind of like celebrating chipping things. So you know, and uh, silly little memes uh, with squirrels in them are as good as any celebration. So. But the funny thing is, we actually took that ship it command and we actually coupled it on um, taking the uh, the status of that project, basically based upon the chat room it was in, and then moving that project status automatically to done. So it was actually a really great way of getting lazy pen testers to update the CAN board, <laughs> you know, uh, who, who typically, of course, uh, don't want to be bothered with, with such things. But again, it's the kind of streamlining that you can do with, uh, you know, with, uh, with a chatbot. Um, similarly, we've also got uh, a system called Git Notes uh, that we developed. And it's a bit like a uh, support desk service. So think Zendesk, you know, that kind of thing. We've got a number of magic email addresses. And if uh, we uh, are performing a particular assignment and we're corresponding with a customer's business unit, you know, we, we've got some customers, of course, with whom we get a very large number of pen tests. And uh, we, uh, of course, have to correspond with our different business units. And then the security officers want to know yeah, they want to be looped in on this communication with the various business units. So as long as we uh, can CC or BCC this magic email address uh, in our correspondence, then what happens is the mail server also, again, has uses the Slack API to put hooks into our rocket chat. So the chatbot can then spit a message into the chat room saying that uh, this message uh, from this send sender with this subject line was just sent at this timestamp click here for more information. And if you click it, it takes you to GitLab where a copy of that uh, correspondence was automatically pushed into the repository in the notes directory. You know, and this basically enables everyone who is in that chat room and who also has uh, uh, access to the corresponding directory to literally with zero extra work on our part, except for using these uh, magic email addresses, to be looped in, you know, to all the correspondence going on in both sides uh, for that project. It was super handy, you know, super efficient. Uh, and again, it's it's chat ops, you know, that's making this possible. Same thing also with uh, our tracking. Uh, of course, if there's anything that hackers hate, it's uh, administrative overhead. <laughs> so things like keeping track of bill billable hours is the kind of thing that pen testers hate. However, we've made it really painless using the chatbot. So you can say essentially raw spot charge the number of hours and then a short description of what just happened. At that point, the chatbot comes back to you and it says, thank you, pen tester name. Uh, you just ch you know, charged N hours. Uh, there's now uh, M hours remaining in your pen test. You have now uh, completed L percent of, your pen, uh, of the total pen test. And then it spits out a progress bar basically showing you how far along you are. Of course, this is now super easy for the pen tester because all he had to do was, he or she had to do was type in this one command to the chatbot. But beyond that, this is also great for the customers because remember, the customers are in our chat room. And when you're doing consultancy, of course, you know, you have a time box and that means that time is money. So if the customers can actually see in real time exactly what the time being spent on, then they know exactly where that money is going. And customers love this. <laughs> you know, similarly, uh, if we, for example, are approach, uh, approaching uh, the end of the pen test, and uh, let's say that uh, we're at the 50% point, uh, and, you know, let's say we made a scoping error. You know, it can happen. I mean, uh, scoping is more of an art than a science, and occasionally it's easy to underestimate things, or perhaps the situation was a bit more complex than we anticipated. So basically, um, you know, in this particular case, uh, we, uh, you know, can say to the customer, you know, dear customer, it looks like we underestimated the amount of work that this is going to be. We're now at the halfway point. Uh, we need to adjust the, co the scope 
And dear customer, can you please tell us what your priorities are so we can make sure in the second half that we can actually focus on the things that you care about and that we can decide together which bits are going to be relegated as uh, future work. So, you know, this gives, uh, you know, customers control. <laughs> and uh, this is something that, uh, of course, uh, the customers really, really like. You know, um, it gives them knobs that they can turn. It gives them uh, choices that they can make. And ultimately, uh, again, you know, it, it's nice because it really enables us to be able to do expectation management with the customers. You know, and even when things go wrong, the great thing about this process is to see things going wrong from a million miles away. And they can also be part of solving it. So this also tends to make a sort of very happy customers. Uh, you know, if anything, just for the reason that, uh, you know, they, uh, like I said, have, feel like they have uh, more control and they can actually steer our pen test to a certain degree. I mean, obviously, they're not steering us completely. I mean, that also wouldn't necessarily be the intention. I mean, we're pen testers and also, you know, we've got ideas uh, about, uh, you know, things that uh, are useful to be done. But all the same, of course, uh, half of pen testing and half of security as it is is just context. And of course, the customer has the context. <laughs> you know, we don't. So, uh, you know, it makes us uh, able to really operate far more uh, effectively. Anyway, by the way, can you all still hear me? I just lost Zoom for some reason. Yeah, we can hear you. At least I can. Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, yeah, well, just give me one second to see if I can join this meeting again. I, don't, I can't reach the Zoom server for some reason. Oh, well. Anyway, so uh, yeah, for some reason I can't find uh, the Zoom server anymore. Oh well, <laughs> sorry. So, um, but in either case, uh, you know, this is really excellent for uh, expectation management. You know, and, and it's worth, I mean, all of you have companies and it's worth, I believe, asking the question, how can I use this openness and transparency in my own company? How can I take my own activities, whether you also are a security company or if perhaps you're a hosting provider or maybe you're uh, a development uh, company, you know, I mean, stop and think, you know, how can including my customers, you know, into the process and really bringing them along and ma you know, optimizing for maximum education, how can this make them happier? And what you're going to find, again, is this openness and transparency, this has market value, you know? <laughs> Uh, and, you know, it really leads to, uh, I, I think, a win situation. I mean, people do ask sometimes, isn't the customer annoying in the chat room? Don't they ask too many questions? Things like that. Uh, my answer is no, uh, absolutely not. Uh, these customers are not annoying. And furthermore, not only are they not annoying, but they're actually super helpful. <laughs> because a customer is like an oracle. It's like having an oracle in your channel. And then you can ask questions like, uh, you, know, um, you know, could you please reboot, you know, this server, it's not working. Or what does this function do? Or, you know, how, how does this code path work and why? Or, you know, um, are you using a strong password here? You know, so we can know whether or not it's worth our effort to, to attempt to brute force it. And that's the thing. I mean, when you're working within a time box, <laughs> of course, anything that you can do to improve the feedback loop really makes for a better experience for the customer. So, uh, yeah. So ultimately, um, the, sorry, let me let this, let this, let this um, announcement finish. And, and actually, we can't really hear the announcer. I think the, the audio is pretty good. We can really. Oh, okay. Okay, the announcement isn't bothering you. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, but uh, but the long and the short of it is, and I think we're also uh, almost out of time because uh, this was supposed to go go till eight p.m., right? Uh, yeah, we're supposed to end at the hour. Though I think folks can okay. stick around cool. if they have questions if you're available. But um, okay, yeah. cool. Then uh, th then basically, just let me make a few more points, and I'm going to wrap this up. So essentially, what I'm describing means, you know, this is all great, you know, for openness and transparency. But of course, what it also means is that you're uh, infrastructure now in production. And when I say production, I mean production in the full sense of the word. If your infrastructure goes offline, guess what? Your whole company goes offline. 
So uh, it does mean that you do need to, uh, you know, treat it as such. And, uh, you know, in that sense, I mean, radically, open security is also a DevOps company. <laughs> it has to be because, uh, again, you know, we can't afford things like outages. So we most recently have been busy with quite a large uh, DevOps factoring, and we are basically busy refactoring everything to put things into Docker containers, uh, make sure that people can uh, launch, uh, you know, uh, their own uh, instances of all this stuff, uh, just uh, quite simply. Also for, you know, isolation, containerization, also for security reasons. Um, you know, obviously access control is, uh, is also a point. Uh, because you don't want, uh, you know, for example, uh, customers executing commands to do things like read out your project management can board, obviously. So we use uh, role-based access control uh, for this. Um, you know, and we also have some accessory kinds of channels like uh, error logging, debug logging, you know, things where uh, basically uh, development staff can actually get access to certain uh, error logs and server logs, but without actually needing a password and a login account on the server. That's an object win. So anyway, uh, I think that's probably enough that I'm going to say about the functionality, but the last thing that I think is really worth uh, mentioning is the fact that this whole concept has been really very successful. So, um, you know, w we've won a lot of prizes for our workflow. You know, and on top of that, you know, in uh, basically five and a half uh, years time, we have grown, you know, Radically Open Security has grown to a company with uh, 40 staff members, uh, close to probably, gosh, by now probably close to almost 100 customers. And we also have won multiple awards. Okay, you know, we are at this point in time a preferred supplier for Google <laughs> and also, you know, for Mozilla and the Moss Project, uh, Open Tech Fund in the United States, but also in the Netherlands, you know, banks, insurance companies, hosting providers, telcos, uh, you know, but also uh, SMEs, universities, uh, and also for the nonprofit sector, we do work at cost price for NGOs, nonprofits, and civil society. So we've got a huge variety of customers. And the other thing also is, again, we've won quite a few prizes. Uh, the Dutch Chamber of Commerce called us one of the 50 most, the 50th most innovative SME in the Netherlands. CIO Magazine also called me one of the, well, basically the most innovative IT leader of the Netherlands. And also uh, the European Commission called me one of the nine most innovative women in the European Union. <laughs> You know, which is kind of uh, interesting given the fact that I'm actually not even European. <laughs> I'm American, but okay, good. Uh, but the point is that, you know, between the open and transparent penetration testing workflow that we've tested or, or that we've uh, developed, and also the uh, business model behind it in um, dividending out uh, essentially our profits to charity, which is basically the implementation of. Uh, they have Mohammed Yunus's vision of uh, type two social business. Um, you know, we're really kind of onto something, you know, and, uh, you know, it's, you know, this has led to some much larger questions, including, you know, thinking about uh, business in general, thinking about Silicon Valley, <laughs> because of course, you know, we all work for tech companies and we know what influence the whole capital scale exit model of, uh, you know, doing t building tech businesses, what kind of impact that has. So, yeah, I mean, this has led for me to this really huge journey. <laughs> you know, this journey is still continuing, which has just gotten weird in recent years, including my actually developing a brand new course for the business school at the Free University of Amsterdam. <laughs> and of course, you know, as a former assistant professor of computer science, I never thought that I was going to be developing business courses, <laughs> you know, but it's actually worth six European credit points uh, in 2020, you know. So all this stuff is going on. I mean, it all started with pen testing, but in the end, you know, it's about social business. It's about openness and transparency. And I think that there's a lot of lessons that anyone can take from this. So anyway, I think that this is uh, enough <laughs> in terms of uh, presenting. And I was thinking maybe now might be a good time to open this up for questions. Um, by the way, I did close my uh, laptop, so if somebody types in a question, if somebody could read that to me, that would be really helpful. 
Yes, happy to do that. And, and uh, thank you for presenting and especially at the end of a long day and on, on the trains and transfers and whatnot. So appreciate it. Yeah. Sorry, this is a bit more hecticness than I'm used to, but I apologize for the uh, slight inconvenience. But then again, it's like I said, this is actually so representative of how life actually is. <laughs> you know, when you're when you have a distributed company and just you know, <laughs> life is crazy if you know what I mean. <laughs> so, Sarah, from a from a meeting perspective, can we keep the line open, or does it term, terminate? Yeah, on? we can just keep it open. So we understand if people have to take off, we'll um, capture questions and answers in the notes. Um, but yeah, let's okay. open the floor for questions. Hey, it's, it's Mark Underwood, if I could jump in. And great presentation. Uh, I apologize for asking who the heck you are in the middle of the presentation. <laughs> so, okay. uh, the, you know, the refactoring process caught my eye because there's organizational refactoring in order to support DevSecOps in general. And I'm wondering where you see this process in light of what we've got to do for CICD pipeline building anyway. Like, I'm inclined to see red teaming and maybe this gamification process as really part of the CICD pipeline and not a separate process like it used to be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we also do some uh, dev tech ops uh, work uh, for our customers and uh, definitely, uh, you know, thinking in terms of, uh, uh, of dev ops, uh, you know, uh, it, it's not just that we're trying to patch things, but it's that we're trying to create unit tests <laughs> for things so we can test for that condition and uh, fix the exactly. problem forever. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, but, but, you know, but the same way also with our own infrastructure. I mean, again, this stuff is production and also for OPSEC reasons, <laughs> you know, I mean, and, uh, we need to make sure that we're not getting regressions. We need to make sure that things are not spaghetti, which of course at the beginning they were. <laughs> I mean, you know, when we first developed it, but the, the last like year and a half, we've been basically, all of our development has been, been paying off technical debt, you know, but it can't be any other way, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, I mean, ultimately we too are a software company and you have to put that time in, you know, just to make sure that everything remains uh, manageable because also security relies on it. I mean, and just to close the thought and, and yield the floor to everybody else here, you know, the, from the cloud native point of view, we are trying to understand what the, the tools that come to us should have for hooks to support processes like the ones you describe in this. You know, and so yeah. some of it is test frameworks and, you know, uh, access to logs and transparency um, about uh, the logging process and, and management mm -hmm. of access. So. You know, I think I think there's a lot to be learned from from this, but maybe the biggest one is just following the standards that are in OWASP and other places. Would you say that? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of uh, best practices, <laughs> uh, and I, I do believe personally that the DevOps community gets a lot of things right, and I think also that the security is uh, well served by learning from their lessons. Good. Thanks so much. Sure. Any other questions? Well, I guess um, to follow up on Mark's question, do you have, so we have a lot of um, folks in the room who develop software tools, as well as people who are security experts who do similar to work that Nuet you're describing. For the tool vendors, are there things that you wish that open source, and they're vendors who have open source projects, most of us, um, or contribute to them. So for what would you wish that more tools that you use did, right, or more open source projects did that would facilitate chat ops and the work that you're doing? Uh, well, definitely any kind of integration with the Slack API. <laughs> Uh, you know, because, uh, I mean, of course, mostly we've been, uh, setting this up, uh, ourselves <laughs> and essentially you can really use the Slack API to hook up to pretty much anything. <laughs> I mean, the chatbot uh, can essentially run shell scripts and from there you can invoke almost everything. Uh, there are tools, of course, which, uh, have GUIs <laughs> and of course GUIs are a bit more problematic, uh, in trying to, to hook that uh, up uh, with, uh, with chat ops. Um, you know, if you're using something like, say, uh, Burp Suite, <laughs> you know, which is one of the very few uh, tools, non-open source tools that I uh, <laughs> sort of allow my uh, hackers to use. So I didn't say, you know, hear Burp that. Suite. I didn't. Sorry, I didn't hear well, the word. Oh, I said Burp Suite. Okay. Burp Pro. Uh, just because, you know, I mean, that is so industry standard. Uh, I don't want to defang my hackers by uh, saying they can't use that because it's not open source. Uh, the other exception, uh, the commercial tool that, uh, that it's okay to use with my company is Ida Pro. Because again, same reasons, you know, for reversing. It's so industry standard. I don't want to take that away from them. Uh, except for that, though, we basically use open source for, for everything else. Um, 
for the most part. I mean, I think, you know, it does pretty much uh, what we need. <laughs> Uh, of course, I think one of the more important things also for us is uh, if we do find security problems that they're responsive. <laughs> uh, Rocket Chat, for example, we have found a number of uh, zero days uh, in Rocket Chat, and we reported, reported it to them, and I have to say they've been super excellent uh, about fixing them. <laughs> So, uh, you know, in fact, they were so super excellent about it that at a certain point they actually decided to hire us as their security vendor because we were doing so much pounding on Rocket Chat. They figured they might as well at least pay us for it. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, yeah, but, but basically but that helps, of course, because, um, you know, as this is production, you know, it's also attack surface. And, you know, just like with any open source, we need to make sure that uh, we can examine it look for uh, vulnerabilities, which in inevitably we're going to find. But when we do, uh, we need to make sure we can report them and uh, make sure that those things are fixed uh, qu pretty quickly. So I would say that that's also pretty important for any open source tool we're going to use. So one just like details. So you said integrate with the Slack API. Does that mean that the other like IRC tools integrate with the Slack API? Like, like so you're using right. Rocket Chat. Like I, I, I'm, uh -huh. I've made a Slack bot, but I haven't and I've made an IRC bot, but I haven't really looked into uh -huh. if I were had an open source project and I wanted to integrate with chat ops, is, is right. there one API that's supported by multiple vendors? Um, I mean, other than, yeah, I mean, other than explicitly supporting a Slack API in some way, shape or form, uh, not so much. I mean, I think if you just can allow for your tool to be able to be run on the command line, <laughs> then we can work with it. <laughs> and that, but that's what I'm saying about anything with a GUI like uh, like like Ida or like well I well, maybe not Ida but but things like um burp suite, you know, I mean it's uh, you can't really invoke that on the command line just because it's uh you know it's very much point and click uh based uh, for the most part. So those are things that are difficult uh to integrate into chat ops because you can basically invoke most things, you know, with just using command line scripting. <laughs> and as long as you can write a script to uh, invoke a tool, then it's something you can easily integrate into your chatbot. It's just anything that involves a GUI, uh, you know, uh, where you can't quite as easily script it, uh, that those kinds of things are more difficult uh, to integrate with chat ops. Great, thanks. Sure. Any more questions? Well, I wanted to give everyone else, I could, I could probably keep you here another hour with questions. <laughs> I'm going to monopolize either your time or the floor. So I'll, I'll let anyone else uh, ask questions, but if not, I have a few. Okay. Anyone? Quick question, the use of Rocket Chat versus Slack. Yes. The use of Rocket Chat versus Slack. So basically, I don't use Slack. Uh, and why do I not use Slack? Because it's the cloud and because data governance matters to me. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just like they say, there is no cloud, there's just other people's computers. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm dealing with people's uh, penetration testing data. I, I can't put, you know, my, my, cu my customer's pen test data into some other third party companies cloud. I just can't do it. <laughs> you know, it just uh, my ethical responsibility dictates that I can't do that. Um, you know, and beyond that, I believe if I'm not mistaken, that Slack was just acquired. <laughs> I forget if it was Facebook or someone else, but uh, I know one of those uh, companies, uh, I believe uh, just uh, acquired them. So uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, that's precisely the reason why I've never used Slack. I mean, on top of that also, of course, uh, you know, Rocket Chat is, Free. I mean, both free isn't freedom, but also free isn't beer, and that's also kind of nice. <laughs> you know, for the same reason why I use uh, the elk, the elk stack and not Splunk and things like that. Okay, so just to clarify and pull everything together, we've been talking about Slack API, we've been talking about Rocket Chat. Um, are we saying? And the question earlier about compatibility, I think, was more about compatibility between the chat tool and the bot than about the bot mm -hmm. and the rest of the world. So I guess the question right. is, you know, are we saying that, are, are, are we inferring from that? Are you implying mm -hmm. that Rocket Chat supports compatible API with Slack? Yeah, no, it does. I mean, uh, uh, Rocket Chat explicitly supports the Slack API. I just, I just wanted to, yeah, you know, we're navigating all around that. I just wanted to be sure that was on the mm -hmm. table in so many words. Thanks. Yep. 
Yeah, that's a, a feature of uh, Rocket Chat. So uh, a question is coming in. Uh, do you uh, do security audits for CNCF? And what resources do you recommend to project maintainers uh, to instill a security mindset with their projects? I guess that's two separate. Okay. Ones. Yeah, uh, I've never done uh, pen tests as such for CNCS. I mean, of course, I would be open-minded to doing so. I mean, if anybody wants a pen test, I mean, send me an email afterwards. I mean, please. Uh, that being said, uh, what kinds of things would I recommend that uh, folks use for instilling security awareness? Um, you know, I think that uh, it starts with the developers. <laughs> And I think, uh, you know, really making sure that uh, I think uh, security doesn't stay in the ivory tower of the CISO departments. I mean, it's all well and good if we're training our security officers. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, I think it's, you know, you need to also have uh, this knowledge in the dev teams, in the business, you know, also to really make uh, a uh, re really meaningful difference. I also think that it's useful to think about for the limited security budget you have, you know, really just to think about how you're spending it <laughs> because you can spend it on black boxes. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, there's a million things like monitoring black boxes uh, that are out there, but at the end of the day, I just don't think that is really much value to you uh, because partly because of vendor lock-in. If you ever leave a vendor and it's closed uh, software, of course, uh, you're gonna lose all the aggregate knowledge uh, and, and usage of that tool, uh, which makes actually very little sense. Um, you know, I also think that, uh, you know, um, anyway, I think it's, it's better to always use open source. Um, if anything, just so you can actually look at the software, see what it's doing, uh, understand it, uh, audit it, make sure it's not doing anything unexpected. Also in terms of data governance, another problem with some of these security black boxes is Lord knows where it's actually sending your data <laughs> and, and what that, third party is doing with it. And I think also that, you know, open source, you know, we don't need black boxes. We need white boxes. We need crystal boxes. And and for me personally, I'm really personally of the belief that anything you can do to sort of increase your usage of open source and the amount of open and transparency uh, in your organization, that's only going to be benefit you uh, security wise. Um, you know, I mean, surprisingly enough, at one point in time, I spoke with somebody uh, from the FBI. Uh, you know, not the most open of organizations, but they actually said that they, the FBI makes heavy use of open source. <laughs> and, and you would ask, you know, the question, well, why is that? Uh, quite simply, I mean, the answer is somewhat predictable. It's because if they can't look in the source code, they don't trust it, <laughs> you know, and uh, as the FBI, you know, they want to be able to audit whatever software that they're using for all of their top secret stuff that they're doing. So, you know, and again, if you think about it, it makes sense. You know, all, all of Radically Open Security runs on open source, uh, like I said, with the exception of Verb Suite and Ida Pro. <laughs> but, um, you know, but the entire rest of the company, that, that's what we use. And I think it really is usable for uh, anything that you need, you know. <laughs> and, yeah, I think, if, you know, we can run a really top-notch, uh, you know, um, penetration testing company using that. I think if, if open source is good enough for us, it's probably also good enough for you guys. And it also then, you know, because it's also free as in beer, and we all like, you know, we all like free, <laughs> uh, you know, it enables us to take our limited security budget and stretch it further and really to be able to use it on meaningful things rather than just, you know, large licensing fees, which I think are pretty unnecessary. <laughs> you know, it's far better, I think, to actually uh, invest that into training your staff. <laughs> and, you know, because half of security is really internal context, and you really need folks, you know, that understand the business, uh, you know, uh, installing and, and configuring, uh, you know, any kind of monitoring boxes, but also being able to perform security audits. I mean, you need... You know, half the battle with security is always context. I mean, the devil's in the details. So I think, you know, again, get that money, that budget away from the licensing fees and instead put that into making your own organization more knowledgeable. And I think that that already will help to get you a whole lot further. Oh, did we lose you? It's possible that we... We lost connectivity. Hello? Oh, there you go. Oh, hey. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Maybe, maybe we didn't lose you. Um, I'll, oh, I'll uh, my, my question, if you have time for, for another 
question? Uh, sure. Um, I, I, as we are from kind of the CNF SIG security perspective, is we're trying to yes. kind of create a security assessment process for open uh -huh. source projects. Uh -huh. Okay. One of the conflicts that, that we've seen or I've seen is that, you know, as an open source project is largely a volunteer, even if their their company is sponsoring their time or directly to uh -huh. payment, there's this kind of you know, this value for money you mentioned of like, I'm not getting paid to write this code. My sure. user base wants to have features and yes, security is kind of this thing that everybody expects. Like how uh -huh. how would you advise our type of organization who's trying to foster security with these open source projects? Like how can right. we pitch that value for time that a security right. audit, a security assessment is really worth the, the extra effort? Right. Uh, well, look, I mean, you, you get what you pay for. And if you send your budget to open source maintainers, then they're going to continue working on the project, <laughs> you know, and if for whatever reason they would drop it, I mean, somebody else could fork it and then you could pay them to, to continue it. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think in the end uh, that is, Pro provides probably better continuity <laughs> and you know a better chance of not losing access uh, to whatever it is uh, that you've invested in uh, if you stop paying so uh, I mean of course open source isn't perfect <laughs> you know I mean it also has uh, of course uh, security problems <laughs> I mean just like any software does you know it's not perfect but all the same uh, you know, if you need something tweaked in your software, you know, something improved, something customized, I think you're going to have a far greater chance of actually getting what you want if you pay an open source maintainer to do that work for you versus, you know, if you're going to give that money to, say, I don't know, Microsoft <laughs> or, you know, one of those big corporates and then expecting that they somehow are going to customize their system for you. That probably is most likely not going to happen. So, so yeah, there's another angle to that question, which is like, we have a lot of so that we have a number of open source projects that are focused on security, right? And of course, they have mm -hmm. security expert maintainers who are very mm -hmm. thoughtful about the details. And we might quibble about certain details, but it's in the details, right? And then there are other sure. projects where they're not their purpose is not security, and right. sometimes uh, an, a maintainer of the project who might be getting paid from a specific company that cares about mm -hmm. that project is like, well, yeah, mm -hmm. security's not our concern. And so one of the things we're working on is how to positively evangelize that, um, you know, without, you know, like there's, there's the hammer kind of things where we can, you know, put sure. things as requirements or being part of the CNCF, but we'd prefer to make, mm -hmm. you know, this kind of awareness that you're talking about to make people feel like security is their concern, right? And so I think mm -hmm. some some folks are are struggling. Like some of the projects are more are, you know, on the spec. They're they're further away on the spectrum of like, you know, they they yeah. think of themselves as a library rather than realizing that somebody just follows their docs and puts it on the open web and then they've just created a vulnerability. Right. 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 Well, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously the one pro project is more conscious than the other. <laughs> uh, the best you can probably do is, uh, you know, try and help them with this, you know, provide them with information. If you have any zero days, responsibly disclose them. Um, you know, if, it, if the situation is really ba that bad, I mean, I guess you could always fork it <laughs> and you're maybe pay somebody else to try and create some you know, other version of it, perhaps uh, that's a bit more security conscious, but uh, not that that's nice or anything, but uh, <laughs> I'm not, yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what to answer to that. In my experience, I've never had that problem, but I mean, I am not, I don't know which situation you have in mind. <laughs> so it's the kind of thing that if you wanted to brainstorm about it, I mean, I could talk to you, you know, talk with you about it afterwards, but uh, I think without knowing more of the specifics, uh, I, I'm not sure in a generic sense, uh, how to broadly fix that. Yeah, I mean, so it's the kind of thing that, you know, like our approach is just to like engage with the project and that sometimes at, we're, we're hoping that adding some extra volunteer help, right, from yeah. our community might m mitigate some of that. Yeah, I mean, in my experience, uh, the open source projects I've dealt with have been quite receptive, but I can imagine that there's probably some projects that uh, aren't. Are there any other questions? I don't, I don't think so. I think uh, Chase asked about from a CNCF perspective, so maybe this is a question of the group, you know, should, security should be part of the graduation gradient, the graduation process. I think 
that cuts to the question of should if there's a group like the CNCF who's kind of overseeing open source projects, uh -huh. at some point should they just be hard and use the hammer and say security has to be part, otherwise you can't be affiliated. So I think that right. like just to answer that from the, from what I know of the CNCF process, what they did before our group became the CNCF special interest group on security is they uh -huh. offered an audit as a benefit to projects that were in what's called incubation before they quote graduate, right? And so all projects get an audit for graduation. And I think that what um, we've observed is like that we're doing with our security assessments is a big, there's a big gap around what does a project think its risk profile is and where its boundaries are, right? Uh -huh. Versus yeah. what their customers might realize are their boundaries and uh -huh. but maybe some of us in the security world might disagree with like hey actually you are security boundary should extend a little further right and so we have i think an opportunity to recommend ways that the cncf can create like you know if projects are already graduated then we work with that community to um to to work through it like and so one of the like the example i'll just you know mention it so that everybody knows like what we might be sort of, like the one that i've heard about is um that uh there's a talk by justin cormack in from kubecon barcelona i think where uh -huh. he went through all of the audits that had done so far and found something unex i thought was unexpected in the prometheus audit where the prometheus team said basically security is not our concern that is a exercise for the customer. We are a interface on your, like we collect audit logs and display them and the customer is responsible for securing this. Mm -hmm. And then it's actually quite challenging to do so. And, you know, I think that personally, if I'd been involved in that early on and it's sort of before my time, I would have said, no, that I don't think that's an appropriate stance. Um, but yeah. that's a debate, right? So that's a discussion. And so I think that that's where we're like, where do we put in those kind of questions, the like Q and A, right? Like at what point yeah. in the process do you're like, wait a second, right? And so we've just designed these security assessments that are maybe a little heavy weight for that because they require a lot of effort on the project to document what is their risk profile? What is their threat model? You know, right. what is their project supposed to do anyhow? And, uh -huh. um, you know, and so that that's, that's kind of one of the things that we're kind of working through. We've got like, you know, 40 CNCF projects at different stages. And we have the opportunity uh -huh. to kind of recommend, you know, checks along the way. And we want right. to do that in a way that ideally is like educational and friendly. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. It's really a question of do you, do you use carrots or do you use, use sticks? I mean, uh, I, I'm typically more of a believer in carrots than sticks. Uh, but that being said, I, I believe some amount of integrating, uh, you know, uh, security assessments, uh, you know, uh, can be helpful. But I think you need to present present it as a as an opportunity, <laughs> you know, and not as a uh, a kind of punishment. So uh, right now uh, we're participating with the uh, NGI. Uh, project together with uh, NLNet, and uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, open source projects, and they're getting European Union uh, funding. And uh, part of the requirements for that funding is that they get a mini, sort of a basic scan, you know, uh, sanity check uh, from uh, Radically Open Security. Um, it's a very small, tiny scope, so I mean, it's very limited uh, in how much uh, we can actually help them uh, in this sort of like little mini quick scan. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you know, we're presenting it to them not as this inconvenience, you know, that, oh, and you have to do this and you have to do that, but more just like, hey, it's a really great opportunity to get some help early in the architectural process and you get it free. Wow, isn't this great, you know? <laughs> I mean, if possible, uh, I, you know, I think that it's nice how uh, NLNet has, uh, uh, you know, has, has presented it to the project. And, uh, I mean, maybe some of them might view it as a hassle uh, all the same. Uh, you know, if you can get them a little bit excited, you know, perhaps they can also grasp it as an opportunity, opportunity to increase their security awareness, which, to be fair, I mean, that is what it is. Yeah, and I think, I think that's a good idea, like, uh, you know, like just talking through it, you know, we could like some of the challenges, like 
if a CNCF end user, which is like one of the companies that's cloud, like deploying cloud stuff, um, uses this project, would it end up being secure? And so you could imagine if the CNCF is interested in paying for this, like to create a, like a test, right? Like, okay, we'll have a team that's interested in deploying the software, deploy it, and then we'll, you know, right after they deploy it, we'll do a chat ops, like, you know, pen test, like a, some kind of exercise with y'all, and then see sure. like, hey, did it come out secure? <laughs> <laughs> what are ways that we yeah. could improve that? Like, you know, things like that. that yeah. might be something. You know, if, if at some point you're interested in brainstorming about this further, I would be happy to do so, but preferably at a moment where I'm not standing outside a train station. <laughs> sure so. thing. <laughs> cool. So, so yeah, maybe we should let you go. And um, are there any la final questions, Robert? You know, like I said, I, I, we could do a whole other Q&A session. <laughs> so I'll let, her, let everyone uh, have the rest of their day back. Just a big thank you. Yeah, this yeah, was thank fabulous. You. Thank you very much. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you yeah, so thank you so, so much for uh, for tolerating my chaos. But uh, yeah, I guess uh, it's par for the course. So uh, <laughs> we really, truly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Oh, no you. worries. And again, All if right. any of you uh, need it, need anything, uh, feel free to just uh, shoot me a mail. Uh, Melanie at radicallyopensecurity.com. Uh, I'm always happy to uh, brainstorm with you guys about whatever you need. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you so much. Have a good evening. So, I'm just okay, gonna stay we'll take on care. A little, all right, bye, Melanie. I'm just gonna stay on a little later and make sure I've captured things from the chat. Um, all right. Oops. All right, thanks everybody. All right, bye-bye. All right, bye. <laughs>
Yeah, it's, it'd be hard to make a complaint about this presentation. Agree, agree. I, I was highly valuable. So, you know, I don't know if I was clear in my questioning about the DevSecOps thing, but we're in the middle of wrestling with this very problem. And, you know, while, you know, I'm on the IEEE standards group that's working on a standard for transparency for autonomous systems, that's a hard problem all by itself. Trying to be transparent, at, but support commercial software, which, you know, open source is great. We're all in that space. But if you're a business, you need somebody that you can pay to take care of things. And so we are in these hybrid models where we've got lots of open source, lots of commercial stuff and the standards around how to do DevSecOps are I think one of the challenges and rolling CNCF products into uh, at least commercial enterprises that are regulated like the one where I work is a big part of the challenge. That's just why I had the question about standards and how to, how to embed the normally adversarial red teaming process, which is really pretty unhelpful. You know, you, you find problems, but you don't generally fix anything beyond the scope of that. And that adversarial process, which she's trying to get away from is a great approach, but it leaves open a bunch of questions, which is probably why you got a couple of pages of notes. Yeah, I mean, I'd see some examples of where the, I mean, you talk about the transparency in like an automated DevOps environment. I see this happening in the AI space. So, and someone on the chat was we were going back and forth about healthcare and I do some, some work in that area as well. Um, but this has come up explicitly. Uh, there was a talk at Stanford a couple of weeks ago about AI in healthcare and they were very explicit. The practitioners, the clinicians were saying, you know, look, there's AI tools out there by commercial vendors. They claim to do X, Y, Z, but because we can't see what's going on, there's no way we're going to deploy that to patients, right? Because of, of concerns about patient safety, about bias. And they gave great clinical examples about how you know, bias in the AI tools can, can lead you very quickly to bad outcomes. Uh, and so, you know, the, I think the same kind of rationale applies to other safety critical things. I'm, I'm not going to use a commercial tool that's not transparent or a commercial service is not transparent if it's in service to mission critical or safety critical applications because I, I, I can't, we can't have a, a larger group understand and review what's going on. Right. It might work the first 10 times, it might work the first thousand times, but what, the next time it fails, uh, then there's some serious consequences. So yeah, it, yeah, it, this is a longer conversation and maybe wor worth having in this venue sometime. But the the piece of this that I'm trying to to find solved in the CNCF ecosystem is some automated testing that has transparency built into it. And so adversarial red team or blue team testing that's embedded in the pipeline that uses CNCF tooling and frameworks is part of the solution, you know? And so that's, you know, that's where my note taking tends to go in these meetings. And uh, we have some projects that try to do that, like for the software supply chain, you know, that are partly automated and partly not. And it's interesting that she's trying to automate more of this with the, uh, all the XML streaming here. Um, but, I think this is a, what, it's part of the SDLC really that we have to find a way to put security into it. And yeah, what are the, what are the standard interfaces gonna be? Yeah, I, I, I like the notion of having kind of a, an interface for adversarial, you know, web hooks, if you will, for lack of a better concept, but yeah. So mm -hmm. find standard that pipelines, DevOps, AI, what, whatnot, anything that's going to be a fully automated or autonomous process has some call outs to, to apply this kind of testing or, or you know, even just transparency dumps for lack of a better word. Yeah. Well put. Oh, well, like I said, we could probably go on for hours. <laughs> All right. Thanks everybody. Thanks Robert for initiating this. This is great. Oh, my Thank pleasure. You. Thanks, Sarah. Be well. Bye. Thanks, Sarah. Bye.